Okay, I just got a note saying this meeting is being live streamed. So it looks like we're up and running. All right, so unless anyone of my staff speaks up, I'm gonna assume the uh, YouTube is now working as well. So again, for those on the YouTube who did not hear before, uh, my name is Alan Lilly. I'm the presiding hearing officer of the State Water Resources Control Board's Administrative Hearings Office. And I will be presiding over today's pre-hearing conference. Um, during the, uh, the, and we do have a court reporter, Francine Dias, who will be recording this as well. Uh, um, and if, I assume if anyone asks for it, we'll prepare a transcript, uh, which we will certainly add to the administrative record if one is prepared. But our official record so far is the Zoom video and audio recording, uh, which we will post to our administrative record folder. Um, so the process for today's uh, pre-hearing conference is I will be doing most of the talk and most of you have been, through, many of you have been through this before uh, and I will call on people to speak. Uh, if you want to say something uh, and I haven't called on you, then please let me know. You can either raise your hand the old fashioned way or uh, electronically and I'll try to keep an eye out for those and, and, and don't be ashamed or don't hesitate to interrupt if you have something really important to say and I haven't noticed you. I will try to pause uh, frequently to give people a chance to speak up. And we do the best we can not, not doing this in person. Um, other than that, and I see most of you, all of you have done this, please do keep your microphones on mute when you're not speaking. Um, sometimes we have feedback problems if people's microphones are on. Um, during the proceeding, all our proceedings, I request that you refer to me as Mr. Lilly, and I will refer to each of you as Mr. or Miss followed by your last name. Uh, this is not a court proceeding, so please do not use your honor or judge, uh, but I do wanna use Mr. and Miss rather than first names uh, to keep the proceedings a little more formal, even though some of you probably know each other on a first name basis. Um, so using the notices of intent uh, that have been filed, I've prepared a list of the people and parties uh, that my understanding is will be participating as partings parties in the hearing and will be participating in today's conference. So I'm gonna go down that list for appearances. And when I call your name or your party's name, uh, please let me know um, if you are appearing either on behalf of yourself or your party and um, state your name and your party's name and then whoever else is appearing for uh, that party. And with that, I'll start with the uh, a Division of Water Rights Prosecution Team. Who's, who's appearing for the prosecution team today? This is Kenneth Petrozelli appearing for the State Water Board prosecution team. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Petrozelli. And do you want to introduce the staff members of the prosecution team who are on the call or on the conference today as well? So um, we have we have people on on the Zoom and people who are following on YouTube. Yeah, just all I, Mr. Petrozelli, all, all I want is to, for you to introduce the people on the Zoom because that's the others don't show up. I mean, certainly people are more than, you know, it's, it's fine for them to listen on YouTube, but I just want to have the record of the people who okay. are on Zoom. So please just so, identify them. So um, I believe we have Mr. Victor Vasquez, Robert Cervantes, and Julie Rosardo. And I believe that is everyone. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, Mr. Vasquez and Mr. Cervantes and Ms. Rosardo. Um, next for Blue Triton, who is appearing for uh, Blue Triton to th this morning? Uh, good morning, Mr. Lilly. Robert Donlan, D-O-N-L-A-N, -N, uh, with Ellison Schneider, Harrison Donlan in Sacramento. Uh, appearing on behalf of Blue Triton. Uh, with me today are uh, Ms. McGuire, Rita McGuire, who introduced herself a bit ago, um, and Chris Sanders uh, in my law office. Okay, great. So good morning, Mr. Donlin, uh, Mr. Sanders, and Ms. McGuire. Now we've got your correct name on the display, so we appreciate that. All right, so who is appearing today for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife? Good morning, Mr. Lilly. Uh, this is Nancy Marie, and I'm appearing for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. All right. Good morning, Ms. Murray. Uh, who is appearing today for San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District? 
Good morning, Mr. Lilly. Meredith Nickel on behalf of the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District. I'm here with my colleague, Sam Bivens. All right, good morning, Ms. Nickel and Mr. Bivens. Um, who is here for the story of the stuff project? Good morning, Your Honor, Rachel Doty and also Jessica Taylor. All right, good morning, Ms. Doty and Ms. Uh, T Ms. Taylor. Where is, I see it, I saw Taylor earlier. I'm, I have to find my tiles here. I'm right here. Oh, there she is. All right, there you are. Yes, good morning, Ms. Taylor. Sorry. I, Good morning. Still learning. It's a little harder than in person, but I think we saved everyone a lot of driving and flying time today. All right. Who is here for the Southern California Native Freshwater Fauna Working Group? We had a notice of intent filed by Steve Lowe, uh, but I do not see him here. Uh, so if, if he appears later, that'll be fine. But right now, I'll just know he is not appearing. And then for the Sierra Club? Mr. Silver, can you go off mute, please? Still have to go off mute. Larry Silver for Sierra Club. All right, good, good morning, Mr. Silver. Uh, for Center for Biological Diversity. Good morning, Lisa Belenke for the Center for Biological Diversity and Ross Middlemas is also on today for the Center. Thank All you. right. Good, good morning, Ms. Belenke and Mr. Middlemas. Uh, for Save Our Forest Association. Yeah, this is Dr. Hugh Bielecki with the Save Our Forest Association. All right. Good morning, Mr. Bielecki. Um, and then I have Amanda Fry just appearing on behalf of herself. So, Ms. Fry, would you enter yes, your Amanda, Yes. Good morning, Mr. Lilly. Amanda Fry. Good, good morning, Ms. Fry. All right, that is all I have. And I think I've covered everybody who's here. Is there anybody who I have missed? All right, well, thank you all very much for, for filing your notices of intent to appear. And, and for those of you who did the optional uh, pre-hearing conference statements. Um, and we certainly, I'll certainly look forward to a productive meeting this morning. Um, I just want to state, I, I have received notices of intent to appear from the following people and entities, and their NOI stated they just plan to submit policy statements and not to participate in the hearing as parties. So uh, some of them may be listening on YouTube, which is fine, and, and, and they certainly can file uh, state, state, um, policy statements whether or not they're on YouTube. And those are California Water Association, Northern California Water Association, Association of California Water Agencies, League of Women Voters in the San Bernardino area, Marianne Dickinson, and Henry Fry. And I see we do have a new person here, um, Steve. Steve, we have Steve's iPad. Can you go off mute and tell us who you are? If it'll let you go off mute. So far, you're still on mute. I don't think we can unmute you. I think you have to unmute. Now, there can you, you hear me? Yes. So are, are yes, you Mr. Steve Lowe? Lowe? <laughs> yes, I am. All right. Good morning, Mr. Lowe, um, and we, my staff has put your name in the display. And I, I just wanted to clarify, you filed one NOI on behalf of yourself and another one on behalf of the Southern California Native Freshwater Fauna Working Group. But do you intend to appear individually or just on behalf of the working group? No, I, I intend to appear individually. And, and the, working also, group, the working group is just gonna submit a, uh, a position statement. Okay, so policy statement by the working group, but you will participate individually as a party. Yes. All right, thank you, Mr. Lowe. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you, sorry I was late. Uh, <laughs> we all are familiar with the challenges of technology and so it is no problem at all. All right, so, and then just so everyone knows, uh, we have received about 25 letters and emails uh, from other people uh, that make general arguments about the hearing. 
Um, we are treating all of those letters and emails as policy statements, and we will continue to do that as more come in. Um, we have put them all, the electronic files of all of them, in a folder in the administrative record titled policy statements. Um, uh, so hopefully we've got them all, and we will continue to add them there. So they will be available for any of you uh, to download and review if you want to. Uh, and then finally, we received an email from an attorney for the United States Department of Agriculture Forest Service asking that he and two members of the staff of the San Bernardino National Forest be included in the service list, even though they do not tend to participate as parties. And, and we certainly will do that. Our notice says we will do that. So our updated, just to clarify, our updated service list will have all of you who filed NOIs, uh, the people who filed NOIs for policy statements, and then the three people from the uh, representatives of the Forest Service who've asked to be on the mailing list. So before I go forward, I'm gonna take a moment to get a, a sip of water. Does anybody have any questions or comments about the parties and uh, who are participating on the updated service list? All right, hearing none, we will go forward. Um, one of the things I would like to emphasize, and I, I think you've all followed this very well, so this is certainly not a criticism, uh, but ex parte communications, um, for those of you who didn't study Latin in school or law school, means basically in this context, a communication between one of you and either me or somebody in my office where the other parties are not present. Um, and we tried to completely avoid those. And I think with email, it's pretty easy to avoid those. Uh, so please, if you have any questions about this process, um, you know, don't go overboard, but if you have any questions that you really need immediate answers to, the easiest thing is just send an email to the administrative hearings office. Uh, we monitor that email inbox and usually get, get to it within a day or two. And then just list everyone else um, on the amended updated service list that we're gonna be circulating as a CC. And that, and then everybody's in the loop on any communications. Um, I, in the past, the water board staff have said this does not apply to what they call routine procedural matters, but I think the envelope sometimes has been pushed on that as to what's procedural, what sort of overlaps into more substantive issues, and what somebody thinks is a routine procedural, someone else may think it's a substantive issue. So I just try to do this where we have no ex parte communications. It's a little more burdensome, but I think that really is outweighed by the fairness uh, to the other parties of you know, just making sure everybody's in the loop. You know, a lot of times you'll see an email from somebody else saying, I'm having trouble uploading my files to the FPT site. What do I do? And you might think, why do I need to see that? But it doesn't really hurt to even for things like that to just include everyone else as a CC. So we're all uh, in the same loop on that. Um, and we will, when we send out the service list, we'll have mailing addresses and email addresses. But I think everybody has agreed to accept service by email, uh, which certainly works much better. You don't have to have the delays of the mail. Um, and of course, it's much easier uh, to include everyone as a CC. So let's just try to make sure to do that all the time. And we will continue to update the service list as necessary. Um, one other thing, some, I don't know whether it'll be an issue in this hearing, but sometimes it is. Um, th this in no way limits your ability to talk to each other. Um, and, and sometimes that can be very useful, even if it's simple things like, hey, I didn't get a copy of that exhibit, can you send it to me? Or more complicated things like, hey, let's talk settlement of these three issues. Um, and please feel free to have those communications anytime you want with anybody else, any other parties to the proceeding, but just do not include my office um, or the Division of Water Rights as a CC on those communications. I mean, certainly you can talk to the Division of Water Rights prosecution team, but don't include anyone else at the State Water Board um, as either a CC or any way in the loop on those communications. If, if there's a signed settlement agreement, we'd like to see it, but anything up to that, we really don't, do not want to be involved. So any Questions or comments on communications before we move forward? All right, thank you. Um, so I'll go forward to the pre hearing conference. Uh, the July 8th um, notice of pre hearing conference and public hearing 
uh, stated that the pre-hearing conference will address the following issues. I'm gonna just read them, although I guess you all are pretty familiar with them, but I will read them anyway. Number one, should the hearing officer amend any of the hearing issues listed in the notice or add any additional hearing issues? Uh, number two, should the hearing officer change any of the deadlines for submitting exhibits and testimony or the hearing dates listed in the notice or make any other changes to the hearing schedule? Number three, should the hearing officer set a deadline for submission of rebuttal evidence and require parties to submit written proposed rebuttal testimony and rebuttal exhibits before the hearing? Number four, what time limit should the hearing officer set for oral policy statements and oral summaries of written statements, for the party's opening statements, for oral summaries of witnesses' testimony, for cross-examination and rebuttal testimony? And then number five, are there any other procedural issues regarding the hearing that any of the participants would like to raise? If so, what are those issues? Now, um, we did receive uh, pre-hearing conference statements from three parties, uh, the Division of Water Rights Prosecution Team, uh, Blue Triton, and Story of Stuff. Did anybody else file a pre-hearing conference statement? And again, don't, don't be embarrassed if you did not. They were optional, but I just wanna make sure I have them all. Did anyone else file a pre-hearing conference statement? <coughs> all right, hearing none, um, that's, I think I've got them. So I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Petrozelli and the prosecution team's pre-hearing conference statement. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the major issues that I thought were raised in your statement and, and what my responses or thoughts are. And then you can um, speak up and add comments as appropriate. Um, one of your, your comments was, should the parties have to file paper copies of exhibits with the administrative hearings office? Um, the way the notice is set up, parties can upload electronic files of all their exhibits to our FTP folder. Uh, we have a folder for uploads and then we move them over uh, to the folder where they're publicly available to any interested party, frankly, any member of the public who's signed up who can download them. Um, we have historically, and this notice requires two paper copies of each exhibit be filed with the AHO uh, because we do use them. Wait, Mr. Lowe, you have to go off mute. You have to go on mute, please. There you go. Um, so we have required that uh, the, uh, Mr. Petrozelli's conference statement says, do we really have to do that? Can, to paraphrase, can we just have them all be uh, done electronically? And Mr. Petrozelli, I, I certainly understand the burden you're talking about. And uh, something I've done for um, a recent hearing, which may make sense here, is not to require paper copies of the longer exhibits, anything over 100 pages, uh, but still to require you to file uh, paper copies of, with the AHO, two paper copies of each exhibit for the exhibits that are less than 100 pages. The longer ones will rely on the electronic files, but the shorter ones, I really would like to get the paper copies. So I'll just ask you if you have any comments on that. And then when I go around later, to everyone else, I can ask them for comments as well. So Mr. Petrozelli, what are your thoughts on that? So, um, I mean, even, I, I believe that, you know, even require limiting uh, paper copies to those um, not exceeding 100 pages, it's it's still a, fair, a fairly large production because there are a lot of exhibits. Um, that we anticipate. And it's still likely, um, in all likelihood, what um, EPA's reproduction department would consider um, a significant um, you know, reproduction job. They've they've notified they they notify us that they expect about a one-week lead time. So to assemble the exhibits and binders, we would need about 10 days lead time. So it basically cuts down the timeline that we have for um, preparing exhibits, preparing testimony by about 10 days. So to the extent, so even though as much as I believe paper requiring paper copies is severely outdated, the board did without it in uh, the water fix hearing, 
Um, if the board can do without it in water fix, I believe we can certainly do without it here. Um, regardless, to the extent you ask for paper copies, um, I like about a perhaps a 10 day extension for the paper cop, just for the paper copies. Okay. Um, another thing is that, you know, there, other than um, as an alternative to the 100 pages, you know, there may be, you know, certain types of exhibits or submissions that you would want printed rather than basing it on page limits. Um, for instance, uh, you know, the specific, specific written testimony from witnesses and things like that. Okay. Well, I certainly understand that. And, you know, I mean, obviously the trade-off is that the ones that we need paper, if we don't get them from you, we have to figure out a way to print them, probably go to the same graphics unit and ask them to print them for us. So, yeah. And, yeah. And, and I would like to add too that, um, you know, that it, it is, it is something that, you know, we physically have to go to the office for reproduction has to physically appear, go to their, op, go to EPA for, and, you know, we're still under, you know, pretty significant, um, you know, in-person uh, restrictions due to coronavirus. And, uh, you know, the reproduction department is also, you know, busy printing, you know, letters and notifications related to the drought. So um, they're, they're busy. All right. And well, I'm sure case, other parties yeah. will agree with you that if they don't have to submit written uh, copies of their exhibits, they'll appreciate it. So, and yeah, and I'll add that, um, you know, in my experience, it can be challenging for, you know, parties who are not uh, located in the Sacramento area. You know, when I, you know, before I joined the water board in a former life, when I practiced in Chico, it was, um, you know, it, it was, it was a challenge getting, getting, you know, those banker boxes uh, down to South. Yeah. Time. Okay. Well, and that's why I've always, we, we have said that as long as you mail them by the deadline, that's good enough, but, but I hear you. So but before we go on, Ms. Fry has raised her hand. Ms. Fry, please uh, go ahead and go off mute and let us know what your thoughts are. I, I am just going, I just need to clarify. So, so you want uploaded, the documents uploaded, and then you want to paper copies and binders. Is that correct? That is what the notice says. Upload so that you don't have to serve them. You know, and I'll, I, I'm going to sound old here, but back in the old days, um, we had to mail paper copies to everybody. Um, and of course, we've significantly reduced that burden because now we upload them and post them. So for all the parties, it's all done electronically. So uh, Ms. Fry, the way the notice states is it's all electronically, except we've asked for two paper copies uh, be mailed to the administrative hearings office for our use. Uh, but I will discuss this with my staff. I, I mean, I, you know, I, Mr. Petrozelli raises a valid point, not just for himself, of course, but for all of you. Um, and it's, it's really just an allocation of burden question versus, you know, do I ask all of you to mail things to us or do I have to have my staff go through and figure out what we need to have printed and, uh, and then do that, which, you know, with, with this many uh, parties and exhibits could be a fairly big burden on us. So and does that answer your question, Ms. Fry? Right. I'll, I'll just print them and mail them. I have a lot of exhibits. So. Okay. All right. Well, well, we'll let's in the pre-hearing conference order what our final decision is on that. Uh, but thank, thank you for thank the clarification. You. Thank you. All right. So, and Mr. Petras, maybe I'll just ask you, Ms. Fry, when you say a lot, how many exhibits do you think you're going to be filing? Well, I've done uh, six years of research, so I, I do have significant uh, exhibits for this case. Okay. And Mr. Petrozelli, you said a lot. How many, what is a lot? A lot can mean a lot of different things in this world. What do you have in mind? Uh, and I, I'm not holding you to this. It's just an estimate. I, it, right. I'm expecting over 300. Okay. Yeah. And I'll the tab, the tabs, uh, the standard tabs don't even go that high. So we would have to make tabs. Yes. Well, th just remember, somebody does have to read all these exhibits. Um, and that somebody is me. Uh, so anyway, we'll see. I don't know, Mr. Donlin, I'll just ask you, how, and no, I'm not holding anybody to any of these estimates, but roughly how many exhibits do you think you'll be submitting if, if we do go to a hearing? 
Um, uh, as we stated in our pre-hearing conference statement, it's unclear right now, Mr. Lilly, um, what our testimony and exhibits will look like given um, the uncertainty about the applicable legal standard. I think to Mr. Petrozelli's concern, um, one way to address the burden on parties uh, of submitting um, hundreds of, of documents um, is to take up our motion um, at the outset. Our, I don't want yeah, to get ahead we, of you. We'll, 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 we'll get to that. I, that's a whole separate issue. I just was asking you how many exhibits you have. You'll get a chance to talk about your motion, but not yet. Okay. Um, I, at this point, Mr. Lilly, I, I don't know. It would depend on what the other parties submit and what um, the burden is on Blue Triton. All right. All right. Thank you. We will consider that. I'm going to have to talk internally with my staff about that because I'm sure they have some thoughts about this as well as, as I do. Um, the next thing is, um, Mr. Petrozell, I'm shifting back to you and your um, uh, prosecution team pre-hearing conference statement. Um, you said you wanted the parties to be able to file amended NOIs and potentially list additional witnesses if the AHO adds new hearing issues. And, and that obviously makes sense. Uh, we will address that in our pre-hearing conference order. We're, we're, you know, we want to get to the truth here and we want all relevant evidence, you know, within reason. So if new issues mean you have, you or any other party wants to call additional witnesses, I mean, obviously we will allow that. Um, your next question was timing of rebuttal testimony. Uh, we have had some hearings where the parties have agreed um, to have an initial round of filing of their proposed written testimony and then to file the proposed rebuttal testimony before the hearing begins. Um, so that's why I raised that issue in the um, notice of pre-hearing conference and hearing. But I, I, the people, I know the prosecution team has objected to that and I think others may have concerns as well. So I'll just say that my plan right now is we will have um, the proposed written testimony for the hearing, we will hold the hearing, and then we will have an additional round you know, with deadlines and hearing dates for the a proposed a testimony for rebuttal um, and, and, and then the actual hearing on rebuttal. This, of course, Mr. Donlin all is assuming we go forward with the hearing and I understand you've raised that issue. Um, the next question I have for you, Mr. Petroselli, and Mr. Murray may wanna weigh in on this as well. Uh, your pre-hearing conference statement says, says states that uh, you may wanna call a Department of Fish and Wildlife witness to testify regarding public trust issues and possible mitigation measures. Um, and what I am wondering is, I don't think the draft cease and desist order that your office prepared and served on Blue Triton and, and for which Blue Triton has asked for a hearing uh, raises any public trust issues. And I'm concerned about the statutory framework that my office operates under because when a hearing on a draft CDO and a water right matter is requested, that automatically goes to our office for hearing, but the hearing is limited to the issues in the draft CDO. Uh, so do you have any comments on whether or not um, my office, I mean, I guess we can hold a hearing on anything, but whether our proposed order could address public trust issues if they are not addressed in the draft CDO? So, so the, the draft cease and desist order, one of, one, of the, um, one, of the, one of the proposed findings was that there currently was not at this time adequate information that uh, the division enforcement staff believed supported findings of public trust violations. But there is currently information being developed and the state water board has an independent duty to make those evaluations. The proposed order, in addition to a cease and desist order, also would require, um, would include an inf what I'll call an information order component issued under Water Code Section 1051. Um, as currently proposed, it would, it, it requests additional information about the nature of uh, the spring diversions. But what we would like to do is uh, request additional information necessary to make public trust determinations. 
So we aren't solely relying on um, studies that uh, the respondent is doing for the Forest Service. And that authority is certainly within the water boards, uh, that is certainly within the water board's authority under 1051. Okay, so I'm, I don't, do, do you happen to have a copy of the draft CDO handy? I'm looking at what looks like to be page 11. I, I, again, I'm not cross-examining here. I just want to try to understand what you're saying. Um, but I do see a paragraph seven on page 11, which says it is further hereby ordered uh, that um, the, the diverter or any successor in interest um, could basically complete studies or within 180 days after completing the studies required by the Forest Service um, SUP AMP submit a report more precisely determining the flows. Is that, is that, the, I'm not sure that concerns public trust. Maybe I'm not reading the right part. Tell me which part of the order concerns the public trust information. So, So the order did not, um, but it did not because as is noted in the report of investigation that was attached to the order, the proposed order and was incorporated by reference, it noted that at the time staff did not believe there was adequate information to make those determinations. So if you believe that as presented up to now, there is an inadequate basis to make that request. Um, we can live with that. If public trust violations are added as an issue, we would certainly like an opportunity to present um, the DFW witness who is noted on our notice of intent to appear um, to provide testimony on those issues. Okay, it's, it's really not a question of what I would like. It's really a question of what the, my office has the legal authority to address. Um, so I'll tell you what, and, and I, you know, I don't wanna put you on the spot here, but um, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. When we get to Mr. Donlin's motion to dismiss, um, I'm going to, Propose we have a briefing schedule, including the prosecution team submitting a response to that. Um, so I think at that time, it would also be appropriate, either in that brief or in a separate brief, uh, for the prosecution team uh, to spell out in more detail exactly what authority the prosecution team believes the administrative hearings office has uh, to consider public trust issues and include them in the proposed order. Um, you know, I, I, I'm certainly, I don't have any decision one way or another. I, I mean, I have no idea what the public trust issues are. I mean, I understand there's a stream with water in it and diversions reduce the flows in it. But beyond that, I have no idea about these issues. But I, but I am concerned that I wanna make sure that our proposed order, whatever it is, does not get beyond the legal authority that we are vested with under the water code. So I'll just note that Mr. Petrozelli and um, you know, at the appropriate time, I think it is important for you to do briefing on that. Um, and before I go on to the rest of your um, issues raised by your pre-hearing conference statement, I'll just ask Ms. Murray, I, th I think Cal Fish and, well, since he's implicated your department's witnesses here, I would just ask you if you have any comments on this issue. Um, thank you. I, I, we did. Um, we did have. We do have a witness preparing testimony and believe that the AHO, the Water Board, has independent um, authority and responsibility regarding public trust resources, and believe that there would be additional studies and timelines needed, in addition to what the Forest Service is um, ha is asking, um, to be able to into for the water right permit that would eventually be issued that 
that needs to be in the record. And so um, we just will work with Mr. Petrozelli to make sure that we are more clear in, in what basic authority the Water Board and the AHO and responsibility the AHO and the Water Board has. Okay, and, I, and the best thing would be if you could file a separate brief on that issue. Uh, and we'll spell this all out in the, I will spell this all out in the post, uh, in the pre-hearing conference order. Uh, but I think it would be good. To, and again, you know, I, I'm particularly focusing on what authorities the AHO has under Water Code 1112 and potentially on 1114. So, I mean, I, I don't want to do something that I don't have the authority to do because that obviously just doesn't lead to anywhere good. So, all right. So let me go down my list here, shifting back to you, Mr. Petrus. And I appreciate everyone's patience as I'm jumping around a little bit here. I'll, I'll try to cover everything and certainly give everyone an opportunity to speak up if they think I've missed anything. Um, your next issue that you raised in your pre-hearing conference statement, and I do appreciate your putting this all out in writing, concerns redacted documents. And as I understand it, um, you said that your, your statement says that there have been some redacted documents which may be posted somewhere or, um, or, or maybe filed somewhere. And I, I guess my question is, what exactly is going on here? What, what are the re redacted documents? What are the redactions? And how do you propose going forward? And, and I'll just say, I, it, I don't think it really does much good for you to send things to me in camera, I mean, number one, I'm very nervous about receiving information that no other party has. That really looks like an ex parte communication to me. Uh, but beyond that, I, I don't think I can do anything with it. I mean, if it's confidential and I can't base a finding on it, there's not much point in my reading it to begin with. So I may be missing something here, but tell me what the story is with redacted documents and what you are proposing. So the redactions fall into two categories. Um, to, my, to my recollection, some of the well logs include uh, what is what you would consider personal identifying information. Um, some of the other submissions from the respondent included in content that they asserted constituted trade secrets. So that content was redacted in the documents that were posted to the website in association with the report of investigation. My, my interest is to be sure you have everything and to have that, to have that full record available in the event um, a party contests or takes issue with that redacted content. We provide, it is not unusual that we provide um, documents separately, especially if it has some kind of personal identifying information or um, financial information. And what I was contemplating was a similar submission protocol. Okay, uh, so just while we're on this, uh, Mr. Donlin, just on this, and I, I fully understand right now your position is we don't need a hearing at all, so and we'll get to that. But assuming we go forward with a hearing, what is your position on what Mr. Petrozelli has said about redacted documents? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, uh, Rita McGuire, who I think is more familiar with particular documents than I am, to, to weigh in as well, Mr. Lilly. Um, I think we need to understand the relevance of those documents and whether there remains concerns um, about the redacted material. Um, I'll let Rita uh, expand on that. Okay, Mr. McGuire, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Lilly. Uh, the information that Mr. Petruzzelli is referring to was submitted to the board a number of years ago in the early stages of the investigation. Uh, they I, I think what we, Blue Triton would prefer to do is have the opportunity to review any documents that may have redacted information to determine whether or not it, it remains necessary to uh, continue that redaction. They were done in a slightly different context, but they did deal with uh, trade secrets and frankly, the safety of the personnel uh, in Strawberry Canyon. 
Okay. I, I'll i just say, I, I mean, I obviously haven't seen any of the docs. I, the only reason this is going to be an issue is if they have relevant information. Um, and, and that may or may not be the case. Uh, but what I'm going to put in the order as best I can, not knowing the documents, is I'm going to direct the prosecution team to work with Blue Triton, confer, just as you have proposed, Ms. McGuire, to determine if, if they're docs, if they're redacted documents where Mr. Petrozelli and his colleagues think the redacted information is relevant to the hearing, then I, they should confer with Blue Triton to see whether Blue Triton continues to assert that um, redactions are necessary and the information should not go into the record. And hopefully you can work things out. If not, I, I guess there could have to be separate briefing on the question of whether or not the trade secret um, assertion is valid and whether or not uh, the redactions should react to documents uh, are, are privileged or should be allowed into the record. So we will have to deal with that. But, but I will just reemphasize that's gonna have to be a separate process because um, our proposed order has to be based on documents that are in the record that everybody can review. I, I, it's just not possible for me to have a finding based on a redacted document which says something to the effect of, well, this redacted document supports this finding, but I can't tell anyone what it says. I, I mean, obviously that just won't work. So I'll flag this issue. We're certainly not going to uh, resolve it today. And I, and I do sense a willingness on both um, the prosecution team and Blue Trident's uh, attorneys uh, to try to work this through, which I greatly appreciate. I, I think you may be able to resolve all or most of the, the issues regarding redactions. I, I, you know, I mean, things concerning field personnel's personal safety, you know, I, I, I certainly understand there may be personnel confidentiality issues there. I'm not sure that type of information is going to be particularly relevant to the, the findings that we include in our proposed order. So I just by way of example. So anyway, um, I'll flag that for an issue that's gonna require some further uh, consideration and work by all of you. Um, let me just continue down my, my list uh, for Mr. Petrozelli. I keep coming back to you because we are still working through your pre-hearing conference statement. Um, you, you raised a question about, uh, we had posted to our administrative record, PDF copies of some of the web page postings from the uh, Division of Water Rights Enforcement section uh, that, and asked about the linked documents. And the answer is the linked documents are not in the administrative record. Um, the PDF, we just did the PDF so we have things because web postings have a way of changing over time and we wanted to have a static document in our record. Uh, but if anybody thinks any of the linked documents are relevant, uh, then the party uh, should submit copies of them as exhibits with their other exhibits. But, but thank you for asking, and that's the clarification on that. Um, next question on your list, witnesses from other agencies, and this may be CDFW, there may be others, but uh, certainly uh, their agency counsel may appear at the hearing and represent them and object, object to cross-examination questions on the on basis that are relevant to that agency. Um, I think it's up to, to you to object to on, on the basis of the, whether the questions are relevant or appropriate for this hearing. Uh, but if they're agency specific concerns, I certainly understand agency counsel will be in a better position to uh, raise those objections. So that, that should be fine. Um, and then I'll just pause there. I've rattled off a lot. Any questions so far, Mr. Petroselli, or may I keep going? Go off mute though, there you go. I forgot. No, you may continue, Mr. Lilly. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm trying to get through this as quickly as I can, but there's a lot to cover, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to ask the prosecution team uh, for its uh, comments regarding the process that the Administrative Hearings Office will follow on Blue Triton's motion to dismiss after Blue Triton's attorneys have discussed that motion. So we will circle back to you. I think it makes sense for them to talk about that first since it's their motion. Um, so. Do you have any other issues or concerns uh, that you would like me to address right now, Mr. Petrozelli?
I'm checking my notes to see if there's anything. All right, and you can certainly come back later. It's, we're, this is informal. No, I, I, believe, I believe you covered everything. Okay. I do have one request for you and your, your colleagues. Um, the, on page six of the prosecution team's revised report of investigation, uh, there's a table one which lists eight different water right complaints, which apparently were the genesis of this uh, action. Um, and I don't have any way to access those. I think those certainly should be in the, the record. Uh, so I'm gonna just ask that you uh, email the PDF files of those complaints to our e AHO email address and we will add them to the administrative record so everyone uh, can see those. So what's a reasonable time frame for the prosecution team to do that? Um, assu assuming, I believe we already have them collected. Uh, so we should be able to email them um, you know, by tomorrow, uh, since we don't have an updated service list, uh, what is the best method of discussion? That's good. I'm glad you're respecting what I said earlier about ex parte communication. So the answer is you can wait. You might as well be assembling them now, but you can wait to transmit them until um, we have sent out our post our a pre-hearing conference order, which will have the updated service list. And, uh, and those, I, I was going to say you didn't need to serve them on anyone because we're going to post them to the uh, our FTP folder, but it's better mm -hmm. to CC them. So why don't you do it that way? And and we were certainly planning to include those with our exhibit package. Yeah. So, okay. Well. Go ahead. So if your preference is to wait is to wait until then, uh, we could do that too. I think I'd like to have them now because they really are background documents. You can certainly submit them as exhibits as well, but I'd like to put them in the record now. But I will give you some reasonable time after we issue our order for, to submit those. So hopefully that won't be a big burden. All right. So I'm gonna now shift over to Mr. Donlin and, and Mr. Sanders as appropriate and Ms. McGuire uh, regarding Blue Triton's pre-hearing conference statement. Um, and of course, the, the, the overarching or, or initial issue raised by Blue Triton's uh, pre-hearing conference statement is whether or not the AHO should have a proceeding, presumably a briefing schedule, and then issue an order on some threshold legal questions which are raised in Blue Triton's motion to dismiss before a proceeding with a hearing. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you what my reactions are now. This is a little bit of uncharted territory for me and the water board. Um, I understand what Blue Triton is asking for is for the administrative hearings office to prepare a proposed order, which would grant the motion to dismiss and then ask, you know, recommend that the water board itself adopt that order. Um, and I think the, the AHO has the authority to do this uh, if the AHO determines the motion should be granted. And just so we're all clear, we've have absolutely, I have done absolutely nothing to decide whether or not the motion should be granted. I just got it and we haven't heard from anybody else. So don't anybody, please don't take any of my comments to suggest I think the motion should be granted or denied. Either way, we haven't decided that. But, um, but Mr. Donlin, I, I think the board's order from the Byron Bethany Irrigation District matter, and that's order, WR 2016-0015 um, is, is something of a precedent for dismissing um, a complaint. That was an ACL complaint, administrative civil liability complaint. This would be a draft CDO. And that was after the prosecution team had put on its case, where in this case, you're asking that it be done just based on the CDO and the report of investigation. Um, so I understand that, but here's my question for you, Mr. Donlin. Would, what authority would the Administrative Hearings Office have to prepare a proposed order uh, for adoption by the board, assuming that the order would not just grant the motion, but you, your terms were clarify the legal standards and have a declaration as to which party bears the burden of proof in this action. Um, I'm not aware of any board precedent 
for doing that? And I, I, I may not be, but are you aware of a board precedent? And if not, what would the authority be for the board, for the AHO and the board to do that? And you have to go off mute before you start talking. There's I think the authority in the first instance um, uh, concerns the scope of the, the draft cease and desist order and the request for a hearing that, that Blue Triton made. Um, as, as you noted earlier, your discussion with uh, Mr. Petrozelli, um, the draft cease and desist order is quite narrow. Um, it alleges a, a violation of Water Code Section 1831 D1 and 1052A. Um, which is an unauthorized diversion and use of water under the division. Uh, the, the net effect of that is that the, the board is alleging um, that the water uh, collected by Blue Triton is subject to the state water board's permitting authority under section uh, 1200 of the water code. Um, our motion to dismiss, it, it tees up all of the legal issues associated with that classification of source water issue. Um, and we think um, that it's necessary to resolve uh, that issue um, before you can lo uh, uh, logically and, and, and um, in an orderly fashion proceed with uh, evidentiary hearings. Um, the draft cease and desist order proposes what we believe to be a novel theory of law for state board jurisdiction. We believe another standard applies the evidentiary burdens, the presumptions, all of the legal standards um, applicable uh, to Blue Triton's view and also to the state uh, prosecution view uh, depends on uh, determination of those threshold legal issues. Uh, we believe it would be quite chaotic for the hearing office to have um, hearings uh, accepting uh, the state's legal position at the same time that you're conducting proceedings um, asking Blue Triton. And, and for example, M Mr. Lilly, um, uh, the, the, the state, um, and it's well established under uh, several state board orders, um, including one cited in our motion, has the burden of proving um, that uh, groundwater is not percolating. That's just black letter law. Um, the state uh, prosecution's draft cease and desist order um, instead proposes to shift the burden to Blue Triton to establish that this uh, that the water that they collect is not developed water or is developed water and puts the burden on, on Blue Triton. Uh, the evidentiary cases needed to establish the state's position or to establish Blue Triton's position uh, depend entirely on some of those threshold legal issues. So we think that the, the legal standard um, embodies the, um, the burden of proof and the presumptions um, embedded in California water law, um, and that in deciding um, our motion, uh, the state water board and, and hearing office first would necessarily need to decide who bears the burden of proof. Whether you need to issue an express finding, um, if you determine, for example, that these source waters um, are classified as, as percolating groundwater, um, I, I, I'm not aware of any authority that says that you need to make that uh, additional finding. Um, I think it's embedded in, in the, the, the state board's determination of what the proper legal standard is. All right. Well, Mr. Donlin, I don't think you've answered my question. Um, I understand your arguments. You've, you've set them out in your motion to dismiss very clearly and, and very well briefed, I might add. I, I found it very easy to follow. But my question is, is there any precedent for the board to make it, to adopt an order on threshold burden of proof type issues before holding a hearing on the rest of the, the matter. I mean, I, I'll, I'll just be candid. I have never, I'm not aware of any board order where the board has ever done what you were proposing. Well, we precisely, th we, we think, um, as I just explained, that the burden of proof and the presumptions are embedded um, in the, the subject matter of the motion, uh, which is what is the proper legal, legal standard applicable to the, the source waters at issue here. Um, we believe that the board can issue an order uh, determining that these are uh, percolating groundwaters 
and that uh, the legal standard uh, that applies to the collection of these waters is water code section 1200, which applies to surface water in subterranean streams flowing in known and definite channels. Um, Again, I, I believe that in making that finding, um, the presumption and the, uh, the, that are applicable to percolating groundwater um, and the burdens of proof uh, will be evident. Um, if you feel that you can't make a finding on uh, the burden of proof, um, we would encourage you to, um, to memorialize that in, in the order. Uh, but we do think it's imperative um, that you make a finding at least on the groundwater classification issue and what legal standards will apply. Sorry, I'm just writing here, bear with me. I mean, I, I guess, so basically Mr. Don, are you proposing that that the AHO make a finding on the groundwater classification issue based on the papers before holding a hearing and then send that proposed order to the board for its consideration? Is that what you're proposing? That's correct, Mr. Lilly. Okay. And I, I'll just say it one more time. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any precedent where the board has ever done that. I, I mean, clearly if, if the board decides to dismiss the draft CDO, I think, I think at least the Byron Bethany order is precedent for that. But I, you know, I mean, the board, I, I mean, I'll just say, I think the board members might have some questions about why are you asking us to adopt an order on a preliminary issue before you've even held a hearing? Mr. Lilly, I, I don't believe this is a preliminary issue. I think it's a threshold issue. Um, Again, as, as we stated, um, and when you asked what type of or amount of evidence we plan on, on submitting, we don't know what case we have to make based on the draft CDO as it was presented to us. We think the legal standard that applied was categorically incorrect. And we don't know if we need to respond to that draft cease and desist order and put on a case defending um, um, the, the issues as framed in the draft cease and desist order, or if we are making a case that the board failed to meet its burden of establishing an unauthorized diversion because the draft cease and desist order doesn't even mention water code section 1200 or subterranean streams flowing in known indefinite channels. So I think an order from the board on that issue, we believe will address the burdens of proof and the presumptions um, but I think we could also be satisfied with just an, uh, an order from the board clarifying what the legal standard is. Um, the, the law speaks for itself on the presumptions and burdens of proof once the legal classification is determined. But we think that order is necessary. Otherwise, you are going to be getting at least two different cases presented to you. It sounds like the state and some of the parties also believe that public trust issues are, are relevant to this proceeding. Um, so we, our, our, our motion uh, perhaps uh, sweeps more broadly than, um, uh, than the state board may be comfortable with. Nevertheless, we think that the, um, an order from the board clarifying the legal standards on the source water, particularly the groundwater classification issue, uh, will help guide future proceedings if the motion isn't granted and this matter dismissed. Okay. Um, so I'm going to shift back to uh, Mr. Petrozelli. Um, the Blue Triton's pre-hearing conference statement has a proposed uh, briefing schedule, which I'm just going to check here. Make sure I have it right. On page seven. It's um, basically responses to the motion to dismiss, which can either be in support or in opposition would be due on August 31st. Replies would be due on September 14th. And then it goes on for oral argument and uh, AHO proposed order and so forth. Um, let me just tell you what I, and this please everyone else listen to. I'm, I'm directing my questions to Mr. Petrozelli, but um, others may want to file a briefing as well. Um, my, I, I do think that 
Blue Trident's motion raises some significant and substantial legal issues that need to be addressed before at least considered, addressed, I'll say, addressed by the parties and considered by the hearing officer. I've, I have no idea how we're going to come out on this, but I think we need to do that before we have the hearing. Uh, so I am going to, in the order, set deadlines for all other parties to file what I will call answer briefs. And those can either be in opposition to the motion or in support of the motion. And then a, a subsequent date for reply briefs, which will be just by Blue Triton and by the prosecution team if, if there are answer briefs that support Blue Triton's motion, then I think the prosecution team should have a right to uh, respond to those. So we'll have two deadlines, one for answer briefs and one for reply briefs. And with that, I'll just ask you, Mr. Petrozelli, Petrozelli to start with, uh, do you have any comments on the proposed briefing schedule in Blue Triton's pre-hearing conference statement? So what the proposed briefing schedule leaves out is what happens after the board would issue an order solely on their motion to dismiss. Because what they're asking for is uh, what would eventually constitute a final board order under water code section 1122 and 1126. They could file a petition for reconsideration on that issue, on that order. They could file a petition for writ of mandate and take it to court and delay reaching the, uh, e even if their motion to dismiss, even if you deny their motion to dismiss, um, Again, they could file a petition for reconsideration, they could file a petition for writ of mandate, and they could tie it up in court for years. And it would be years before we reach the merits of the case. We can address those permitting authority issues in, within the hearing issues that are outlined within the hearing notice. If you want to address them separately, I would strongly discourage the AHO from doing it in a manner that would result in an order issued under uh, 1114 because of those potential delays. If, as in BBID, um, you know, after our case in chief, you believe our case is so similarly defective that it merits dismissal, that is a matter we could address when we get there. Okay. Sorry, I'm just writing here, bear with me. These are all important comments, so I wanna write them down. Um, I'll add that, you know, from a chaos perspective and an uncertainty perspective, um, you know, this isn't civil procedure. We don't have specific uh, code sections, rules, and a body of decisional law for demurrers and failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. So, you know, we don't have that set of rules and context with which to evaluate their motion, what they've characterized as a motion to dismiss. We don't necessarily know what it is or how to respond to it or what the decisional standard should be. And one of the things we had to argue about in BBID was what the parties were requesting. Okay, and well, um, that's well documented in the briefing in that in that board decision. Okay, yeah, and I, I have not seen that, but but I do. I, I did think of your concerns about delays too. If there's some interim order that is, is adopted by the board, presumably uh, then there could be judicial review, which could, I mean, we all know, could take several years to go through a trial court and appellate court proceeding. Um, and that, that could be a problem. So, so Mr. Petrozelli, I'm gonna come back and ask you the, my question again. Um, I, I think these are, are good points you were making again, no idea how I'm gonna come out on them, but I do think it's important for you to prepare a written brief uh, that responds 
uh, to Blue Triton's motion to dismiss. Bo both on the merits, I assume you disagree with their arguments, sounds like you disagree with their arguments on the legal classification of the groundwater or the water. Um, you probably disagree with some of their arguments on burden of proof. And then you're also raising what I think are some important procedural concerns. So I, I need to have you put those all into a brief and file it and, um, and of course serve it on the parties so we, we can go forward and I have legal arguments to evaluate and resolve. Um, so what is, is August 31 a reasonable deadline for that? And are we briefing the motion to dismiss or the schedule or whether we're considering the motion to dismiss? Your, your brief would be a response to the Blue Trident motion to dismiss. Okay. What, what, and, and that's not only responding to the arguments and issues they've raised, but raising any additional points you think are, are relevant that are raised by the motion. I will get to you, Ms. Doherty. I do see your hand, so bear with me. But I want to wrap up here with Petrozelli on this point, Mr. Petrozelli first on this point. So yes, it's response to their motion to dismiss, including whatever additional arguments you think are appropriate. I, we can certainly prepare that um, by August 31. Obviously that would, um, and I assume that would uh, change the other deadlines that are currently in the hearing notice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, you know, um, because if there's going to be a round of reply briefing and then sometime for my office, for my colleagues and I to prepare an order, uh, we are going to have to delay the current deadline for filing exhibits, which I think is August 31st, and the current uh, hearing schedule. Um, I, I, I'll talk about what I have in mind for that in a minute. But yes, I, we, we can't. We need to get this, these issues at least heard, briefed, and, and addressed. I don't know whether we'll resolve them or not, but at least addressed before we go forward with the hearing. So I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Petrozelli. Actually, I think 30 days would be, would be better for us. Okay, so that would be circa, you can tell how old I am, I still have a paper calendar. So today's August 11th. So 30 days would be September 10. Um, so either September 10 or September 13, depending on whether or not you want to work on the weekend. I, you know, that I'd rather you have more time and, and brief these things thoroughly, not necessarily longer, but I'd rather have good briefing than have you rest to that. So we'll potentially look at September 10 as a deadline for that. So that we'll come back. Um, do you have anything else on that point, Mr. Petroselli? We're going to circle around on other points. Yes, because it, it's, it, it always helps to have like the written briefing order when doing briefing. So um, even though this might be an early question, when would you anticipate having the pre-hearing, issuing the pre-hearing conference issue that lays out the briefing instructions on this motion to dismiss? Uh, fair, fair enough. Um, I mean, it's a fair enough question. I, I'm going to do my darndest to get it out by this Friday because I mean, it, it, it's pretty much going to say what I just said, but, it, but you're right. It's good to have the order in front of you so you know what you're having to address. So, all right. So, Miss Do it's Doty. Is that how you pronounce it? Doty, yes. All right. So, Miss Doty, you had your hand up and you've been patiently waiting. What are your comments now? Did on this point, um, the, there was some question. I guess we could perhaps call it the jurisdictional briefing because there was some question about your authority to entertain public trust arguments, which we would very much like for you to do. So in the interest of efficiency, can we brief that simultaneous with the other um, jurisdictional authority issues? Yes, I was going to include that in the order, but yes, absolutely. I'd like to get briefing on all of these pre-hearing issues in as soon as we can, so that then I can prepare whatever kind of order is appropriate 
uh, going forward. So, yes, and and that's wouldn't be that would be for any party who wants to. And, and we haven't gotten there yet, but uh, there have also been some issues raised in some of the papers regarding waste and unreasonable use, and administrative civil liability and penalties. So that that would be the deadline for filing briefings on those issues as well. And, and the basic, I mean, I'll just tell you the basic question is. Does the administrative hearings office in this proceeding have the authority to consider those and to address them in the proposed order or orders it sends to the water board? That was a long way of saying yes to your question. Thank you. All right. So, and we will, you know, certainly other parties will have opportunities to uh, file briefs by that same deadline. Mr. Donlan, go ahead. Just to, to be clear, Mr. Lilly. Um, Blue Triton filed with its pre-hearing conference statement um, the motion to dismiss. So that that paper has been submitted into the record. Um, how exactly do you intend to um, reconcile a process for this jurisdictional or um, extra record issues um, uh, briefing with that? Uh, since we are, um, I guess, one one phase or one briefing um, behind at this point. So is, I'm not sure by extra record issues, you mean things like public trust? That's correct. Um, yeah, and I, th I think the answer is uh, Ms. Stody and anybody else who wants to, they file their briefs and then in your reply briefs, you can, and if, if you need to, I mean, I think you can do it in two separate sections, but you'll have the section responding presumably to Mr. Petrozelli's arguments, and then you can have a separate section responding to these arguments. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to delay that. I, and you can say, you, you know, you're a good lawyer. You know how to say these things. You can say something to the effect of, "We think the board should just dismiss this draft CDO, but if they don't, then here's our position on the public trust issues." I mean, I, I understand you have some uncertainty, but on the other hand, I don't want this thing to just drag on and on and on. And I, I think. This can be done with briefing at this point, um, with with these two additional rounds of briefing. I, I we appreciate that, Mr. Lilly, and and want to uh, abide by the schedule that you're laying out. Um, I just want to know: do does Blue Triton submit um, a brief on the issue of um, public trust and extra record issues at uh, the time within 30 days, or are you looking for us to wait? until our reply brief to um, uh, brief this issue? I think you should wait till your reply brief. It, it, it wouldn't be fair to you to guess at what other parties' arguments are gonna make. Um, so you, in fairness to you, you need to see their arguments and then respond to them. All right, so Ms. Doty, your hand is up, go ahead. Now, I, I really do not want to delay this proceeding at all. Um, however, will there be an opportunity then for us to have a rebuttal to the arguments raised by Blue Triton in response to our argument that we should be allowed to put on public trust evidence? Oh boy, um, it's it's a good question. I, I'm torn. I I I do see your 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 point is they're going to be raising their arguments for the first time, and you want to be able to rebut those. So I, I think we're gonna to have to allow that. Um, I believe I, the question is somewhat discreet though. It's, it's can, can, public, can you entertain public questions about whether or not there's been a violation of public trust or whatever. Yeah, I, and, and so we can simultaneously brief it and then each have a chance at a response. Yeah, so you wanna brief why you think we can consider or may consider public trust. Mr. Donlin clearly is gonna brief why we should not. And then you wanna be able to respond to what he says. And, and that, that makes sense. But just as he's going to get to respond to the prosecution team, uh, you're going to want to respond to, to him. So I think we're going to have to have three rounds of briefing. I, 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 we'll, I'll see what's a reasonable schedule, but, but it, these are valid points. Okay, does anybody else, and I haven't set the schedule, maybe I should just do that while we're on here. If the, the next round of briefs are due on September 10, a reasonable time for the reply briefs. Oh gosh, I'm I'm looking at October first to give you three weeks, <clears throat> and then hopefully by then the issues that are left 
are fairly narrow. So the next round would be October 15, and that would be it. Um, I think those are the, the that's the schedule I'm, I'm looking at. Does anybody have any comments on that? Mr. Lilly, if I might, uh, we do support that schedule. That's fine with us on both issues. Um, I do want to say though, that we also have an interest in bringing this proceeding to a close. Um, it's taken us six years to get the draft cease and desist order that we got in April. There was years of no communications between the state board staff and Blue Triton. Um, we are not interested in delay, uh, but the implication being um, that the state has had some control over uh, the pace of this proceeding thus far. I, you know, that's fine. And, and you know, I, I'm not going to get into assigning blame at that. I'm sure we go around in circles and not get anywhere on that. Um, I'll just say the bottom line from my point of view is when I took this job, which was just well, less than two years ago, I met with all five board members individually to find out what their thoughts were. And the one message that came forward from all of them independently was, you've got to move the water right process forward. Things are taking too long. Um, so those are my marching orders to the people I report to. Uh, we now have a new board member, but I'm sure she has the same view as, as her, her predecessor. Um, so that's why I want to keep things moving forward. Well, I probably would want to anyway, but just so you know, I have clear directions to move things forward uh, from the decision makers here. So if it seems sometimes like I'm pushing, that's why. All right, so that covers a lot of this. I will look forward to your briefing. And, and frankly, I'll just say, even if, um, even if the, the, the motion to dismiss is denied, um, and, and we go forward with a hearing, um, this briefing of these issues, I think will be very helpful. In, in effect, they're, they can be somewhat like opening uh, trial briefs um, because I think they're gonna help define the issues, not, maybe not resolve them, but at least spell out the party's arguments on the issues. So Ms. Fry, your hand is up. You've been waiting now patiently. Yes, I just want to know if, um, if since I'm not an attorney, if I can submit a, a brief too. Absolutely. Okay. And, and if you wanna get advice, if you have an attorney or local legal clinic or something that can help you, that's fine. If you wanna to talk to the other attorneys for the other parties in this proceeding, don't have my office involved, but you can do that. But the answer is yes, you may file a brief. Thank you. I'm probably gonna to have to put some page limits on these so that they don't get out of hand, um, but I will think about that. All right, Ms. Nickel, your hand is up. Go ahead. You are an attorney, so tell us what your concerns are. Thank you. And I just want to clarify um, the, the briefing schedule. Um, I understand now that on September 11th, there will be um, briefs submitted on issues that may go beyond the motion to dismiss that was brought by Blue Tri Triton. I think I understand them to be public trust, but you also mentioned um, waste and unreasonable use, as well as um, uh, you know the possibility of an ACL. And so for the reply deadline on October 1st, originally I think I heard you to say that that would just be for Blue Triton and for um, the prosecution team to respond. But with these new issues now coming in on September 11th, would it make sense for that October 1st reply deadline to be for all parties who may have something to respond to in the September 11th briefs? I'm trying yes. to keep it simple, but I just wanted to clarify that. No, that's a good point. And just to clarify the deadline, September 10, the 11th is a Saturday, so. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> I never know whether I do attorneys a favor or, or not to make a deadline on a Friday rather than a Monday, but at least then you don't have to spend all weekend working on it. I, I used to be there, I know. But yes, Ms. Nickel, that's that's a valid point. Right. Um, you know, I cringe at the thought of, how much paper and you're not none of you're going to file these in paper so i have to print it all too but i'm joking but then i do have to read it all and work with my colleagues to get through this so it may take us a little while to sort through it but on on the other hand i'd like to give everyone full opportunity to make their legal arguments uh, so we can sort them out and figure out where to go forward and these are these are very important issues and we have to determine what the best way is to address them uh, before we decide whether we're going forward with a hearing and so forth. All right, so does anybody else 
have any other comments on this rough briefing schedule and concept, and obviously we will spell it out in more detail in our order. Um, Mr. Lilly, that, that, that was my, my question. Um, I, uh, not to quibble with uh, Ms. Uh, Nichols' framing of the issue, but I, I understood uh, the question about the applicability or the relevance of public trust and reasonable use and ACLs in this proceeding to be whether the hearing office has jurisdiction um, to consider those, not um, arguments on the merits of those, those issues. That is certainly what I want to hear about. I mean, I don't, don't really want briefing on the merits of the public trust or reasonable use issues. It's, it's the question of authority at this point. I, I, I thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Donnelly. We have to get through the authority issue before we get to the merits. Just let me write that down. It's complicated. This is why water cases take so long. All right, so I think we've taken care of that. Um, certainly we will be issuing an order uh, trying to spell all this out with a schedule as well as we can. Um, just one other, a couple of other housekeeping matters. Um, uh, Mr. Petroselli, the Blue Trident's attorneys uh, filed a copy of an April 16, 2020 letter, uh, which they'd sent to the Division of Water Rights Enforcement section and asked that that be put in the administrative record. Again, these are just background documents. They're not evidentiary and that, that document is primarily attorney arguments, but it certainly seems appropriate to me. I mean, it's in the record now as part of their pre-hearing conference statement, but it seems appropriate to me to make that a separate file and add that to the, to the administrator record. Do you have any objection to that? We, we do not object. Okay. I mean, again, just, I just want to get the papers out there so everyone can see them as much and, as I can. And Ms. Mr. Lilly, uh, one, of, one of our experiences with this process is that if we don't issue something publicly in some way, even on the website, uh, we'll have to issue, release it through a public record request anyway, so. Right, okay. Well, one, I mean, that actually leads into my next question, which I was gonna ask Mr. Donlan. Um, Mr. Donlan, you're, I think it was in your pre-hearing conference statement, uh, you referred to a process and schedule for dis your words were process and schedule for discovery and technical evidence and testimony. Um, I, I guess I'll just say, what are your concerns here? And do you see a need for discovery in this matter? Um, again, Mr. Lilly, um, I think it's, it's highly likely that we will have a need for discovery. Um, uh, depending on um, the disposition of our motion. Um, um, the state has not um, developed independent science in support of its position. It's relied on um, information uh, that it's been able to uh, glean from filings by Blue Triton and other parties. Um, if we're going to have expert um, uh, witnesses testify in a hearing as to the technical issues, um, I think we at least need to contemplate the possibility that we will need some discovery in advance of, the, of those proceedings. Um, as we framed it in our, our pre-hearing conference statement, these, uh, these would be subsequent evidentiary hearings um, once we have some clarity uh, from the motion to dismiss and the briefing on, on that issue. Okay, well, I understand what you're saying. Um, normally, parties don't do discovery in water board proceedings, primarily because the, the parties have to submit all the written testimony, the written proposed testimony in advance. So that pretty much lays out what the witness is going to talk to. And we're, we're usually quite rigorous about holding witnesses to summarizing their pro written proposed testimony and not allowing them to go into other subjects. But but there certainly are some provisions in the water code that provide for discovery 
Um, and if the parties want to avail themselves of those provisions, they can. And of course, the parties receiving the discovery can respond as they deem appropriate. So uh, I will leave that out there. I, I will just say that um, I'm not going to allow discovery to delay this process. Um, and so at some point, Mr. Donlin, you may have to consider starting discovery before you have a ruling from this office on the issues we've been talking about today. And that's, that's really akin to, in a civil proceeding, there may be a pending motion for summary judgment that may dispose of all or most of the issues in the case. And yet, often you have to do discovery before the court has resolved that motion, uh, just so you can meet the trial schedule. So I will try to set that out uh, in the order as well. If you're talking about expert witness discovery, through depositions, normally those can be done fairly quickly. It's not a, and presumably the expert witness is prepared if, if he or she has prepared written proposed testimony. But um, I just want to make it clear, I'm, I'm not going to be interested in delaying the hearing to allow a long period of discovery, but subject to that, uh, certainly you have whatever rights you have under the water code and the reference other statutes to do discovery. So Anything further you want to say on that, or does that cover that for now? No, thank you, Mr. Lilly. All right, so I'm going to go over to the story of stuff, a pre-hearing conference statement. I'm, I'm trying to remember, who is our attorney for story of stuff? That should be Ms. Doty. Okay, so Ms. Doty, uh, we've covered this somewhat before, but I'll, I'll just say you're pre-hearing conference statement also raises these public trust issues and also waste and unreasonable use issues. So I think it's gonna be important in the briefing um, and, and you don't need to tell me today, but I'll just say, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's going to be important for you to explain or you know, the legal basis for why you believe that this office in this proceeding has the authority to consider those issues. And again, I, you don't need to get into the merits of the issues. That's a whole separate story, but just the what we'll call jurisdictional, threshold jurisdictional issue. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I certainly understand that you have some significant concerns here and I'm not belittling those, but just as a threshold matter, I'm concerned about when all I have before me is a request for hearing on a draft CDO, how far beyond the issues raised in the draft CDO the hearing can go. So I, I hope you can address those in your briefing. No. And the similarly, for fines and penalties, your, your, um, your pre hearing conference statement also talks about those. Uh, I don't think, unless you can point to some authorities I'm not aware of, I don't think this office has the authority to include proposed fines or penalties in an order unless there has been an administrative civil liability complaint filed by the prosecution team against the respondent, which uh, we don't have here. And, and maybe I should just ask Mr. Petrozelli, and if you can't tell me this because it's under your deliberations, I understand, but can you tell me whether or not the prosecution team is planning to file an administrative civil liability complaint against Blue Triton regarding this, these issues in this hearing? We, we certainly retain the right to do so. Okay. Um, I can, clearly we haven't done so yet. All right, we'll leave it at that. I know that in the past, the PT sometimes has filed an ACL complaint later than its draft CDO. But I won't, I won't ask you to say anything more if you don't want to now. Thank you. I guess I would say if you're planning to do that, the sooner the better, because otherwise it's gonna delay the hearing schedule, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, okay, and Ms. Doty, you're, you're, um, just to cover the issues here, your, your pre-hearing conference statement also talked about priorities of municipal supply. So again, that's the type of issue I think you should raise in your briefing. The arguments in your brief should include whether or not the administrative hearings office has the authority to consider that in this proceeding. Um, and I think your 
just the last question. You talked about um, documents that have previously been filed with the Division of Water Rights Enforcement section. And just so we're clear, uh, we have a literal wall. They're in a totally different building uh, than we are. We're both in downtown Sacramento, but in totally different buildings between the Division of Water Rights Enforcement section and my office uh, and the, the Water Board's Office of Enforcement. And I have no way to access their files. I mean, if they post it on a public website, I can access it. Beyond that, I have no way to access any of their files or documents, including things you may have filed with them. So the bottom line is if you want my office to consider any documents that you, or this applies to anybody, anybody who has filed water rights enforcement center, enforcement, you need to of those and submit those as hearing exhibits. Otherwise, I, I don't have any way to get to them. And obviously with the ex parte rules, I'm not gonna go ask them to look at their files. They wouldn't let me look at them anyway, but I'm not even gonna ask. So, Mr. Right. Lilly, my, yeah, question, my question on that was about record, um, um, the, the contents of the record, both. Um, so for you, I understand now, um, and then the record that will be before the water board, will that be just whatever record comes up out of the hearing or will that include the entire record that's been collected over the last several years by staff? And then um, even beyond that, on any writ proceeding coming out of this, will the administrative record include just whatever is established at the hearing or will it be all the material that uh, the water board has received through staff over the years prior to this? Okay, good questions. Um, and I can answer the first one and part of the second one. Um, as far as the record that goes to the water board, regardless of what we go forward, at some point we're gonna have a proposed order that we will transmit to the clerk of the board uh, that then the board will consider adopting. And the record that goes to the board at that point is the record that the administrative hearings office has compiled. So it's basically what's in our FTP folder. That's one of the reasons we have our FTP folder so everyone can see what's in our record. And of course, as people file exhibits, we will add them to that record, but that's it. Um, that's what goes to the water board uh, for their consideration. They do not see um, any files from the enforcement section. Um, they're, they're walled off. They're part of the hearing decision-making team, not the prosecution team. So if you wanted to go to be on the record goes to the water board, you have to submit it as an exhibit. Um, your second question, if there's a court review, if somebody um, is dissatisfied with the, the board's final order and files a petition for writ of mandate in court, um, the, the rules that apply in the, in the Code of Civil Procedure for administrative records govern that. Um, and I, I don't wanna give legal advice on that because obviously that's a legal proceeding that I won't even be involved in, uh, but normally the administrative record for that is going to be limited to what the board, the decision makers saw. Uh, there are some exceptions in Code of Civil Procedure section 94.5 uh, for going beyond that record, but they're pretty limited. So again, normally they're, the court review record is what the water board sees. So does that answer those questions? Okay, thanks. All right. Thank you all for your patience as we go down this. Um, I'm, we've, we've covered a lot. Um, we've had some people speak up. Rather than go down the list of all the other parties, I'm going to just ask, does anyone else have any comments, questions, or anything else that they would like to say at this time regarding anything we've covered today? If so, you can raise your hand or um, speak up. Okay, good, or not good, whatever. Hear, hearing none, we'll move on. Um, I do wanna say that um, if we do proceed to a hearing, I would like to conduct a site visit. Um, logistically, they're a little bit of a challenge, but in our experience, they're extremely valuable to me and my staff, no matter how many pictures, maps, diagrams, and so forth, uh, we look at, there's no substitute for seeing the facilities in real life. Um, 
that of course we will notice that will be scheduled after the initial hearing. Um, so we have the evidence in and probably before the hearing on rebuttal, that seems to be a logical time to go forward with that. Uh, we will issue a notice and uh, to the extent logistics allow, which I hope they will, uh, any interested party may participate. Um, we, we sometimes have a little challenge on exactly what administrative record we can make when we're out in the field. Um, we do have a GoPro video audio camera and can do some. Obviously, it's a little harder. We can't just get everything down if everybody's talking, uh, but, but we'll work through that. Uh, so I guess my question, I'll start with, maybe I'll start with you, either Mr. Don Lynn or Ms. McGuire. If we have a site visit, is there any particular season that you think is good or bad for a site visit? Ms. McGuire, I'll ask you to handle that one. I think you've been out there. Uh, Mr. Lilly, I think year round, of course, if there's any rainfall, you know, runoff events, whatnot, make the canyon particularly difficult to get to. But a couple of observations. One, um, the Strawberry Canyon spring sites are in the San Bernardino National Forest. Under our adaptive management plan and our permit requirements, we have to work out the logistics of any uh, site visits with the Forest Service. Uh, in addition, there are no roads. We typically helicopter in. It's a, a very uh, deep canyon, difficult terrain, so it's not easily reached. Having said that, we've accommodated many site visits, including members of the uh, Division of Water Rights staff, so we're happy to accommodate you. It'll just take a little planning. Okay. And if, if we can't, if there's some limit to the number of people who can participate, we'll try to get representatives of the different groups to participate and go forward. Um, I did notice from one of the field reports about an encounter with a rattlesnake. So uh, obviously we'll be careful of those. We don't want any bites. Um, so Ms. Doty, did you have a question or comment on that? So, so I would ask just Mr. Lowe to be able to be included in that. He's a witness for us and also appearing in his own right. I was a biologist on the Forest Service for several decades on this district, and so is familiar and probably should weigh in as to the the best timing. And it's oh. you know it's several different wells. Some of them you can in fact walk to because I've walked to to one of them. Um, our, our diversion points. Um, some of them are very remote and most easily accessed by helicopter. So he could perhaps help with those logistics. Okay, Mr. Lowe, would you like to weigh in with that? glowing recommendation and you just go off mute if you can figure out how this is why i don't use ipads for video conferences i wouldn't be able to figure out how to do it either there you go okay mate is that okay now yes okay um she's right any any season could be good. Any any season could have a problem um, with the weather. The spring sites themselves are very difficult to get into. Um, a helicopter would help you guys to do that. Um, I'm getting too old to walk into those upper spring sites. Um, so if there's a helicopter, um, I would like to be included in that. The To really see the stream and see the issues though, you need to not only look at the spring sites, but look downstream at various spots. And one of those spots is down in the San Bernardino um, foothills where it hit, enters the city of San Bernardino. Um, that's habitat that is very important for a lot of species. And then midway up is a, a, a place you can get to if you go through, um, there's a, high, a road that goes up the canyon and so there's like two spots in the lower canyon you'd want to see, and then the spring sites themselves. So um, to really get a picture of what's affected by the withdrawal of the water. So um, yeah, I think any season any season could be fine. Um, the winter could be bad. You could get snowed out. You could get really bad fog at different times of year. We've had all those problems. So. Um, yeah, I think we need to be flexible and, and try to do it when the time comes, when you're ready to have that uh, field review, then we can figure out a time to make it work for everybody, I think. Okay. And we'll certainly go through logistics 
and all that. I just wanted to get some advanced info. Uh, so Ms. McGuire, and, and then we'll, I'll go to you, Ms. Fry. Go ahead, Ms. McGuire. Uh, just one other safety suggestion. We do have a fire season, so we want to avoid that simply for the safety of the people. In addition, the helicopters are quite small that can only accommodate two or three riders. So we do have to think about the logistics and we can work that out. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, I certainly respect that. And we absolutely don't want to do anything that's not safe. Um, that's number one priority, of course. Um, and we want to be fair to all the parties. So with those caveats, we'll, we'll talk about it and see what we can work out. But I mean, I know it's a bit of a burden, but on the other hand, as I say, it's just extremely valuable to us to be able to see things in real life. So we'll go forward. So Ms. Ms. Fry, we have a couple more hands, but Ms. Fry, you're next. Right. Thank you. I have hiked this area many, many times now over the last six years, and most of uh, Strawberry Creek, much of it's now dried up in the upper canyon um, with just various spots of water left because you know, if groundwater doesn't get to surface through the spring, if the spring's blocked, then it doesn't get to flow into the stream. So um, yes, you can hike. I'm happy to meet you and hike in there. Mr. By Dr. Bylecki and I have hiked in and many others many times. So you need a good set of hiking boots is what I'd advise and, and water, so. Okay, well, if it makes you feel any better, I, I may be old, but I can still get around pretty well in the field. So uh, uh, we'll do what we can. But I, I appreciate that. And, and obviously we, we wanna make sure that whatever we do is, is safe and appropriate. Okay, any other questions on that? I think Mr. Bilecki, you wanted to say something, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Lilly. Uh, as Amanda Fry has just stated, uh, she has hiked into there from the upper part from uh, Highway 18, Rim of the World Highway. I have hiked that access also multiple times to observe the headwater spring. So the access on foot from the upper uh, to the upper spring to the headwater is uh, moderate. Uh, in nature and is uh, certainly accessible, except as uh, Mr. Lowe has pointed out in winter where it could be snowed out or rained out and not accessible. So I am also happy to be involved uh, and not requiring a helicopter to the upper springs if that uh, facilitates a thorough evaluation of the situation on the ground. Okay, well, I mean, obviously if we go forward Two things. Number one, we'll set out and I, I will we'll develop an itinerary so that we, we all know what, what we're doing with some kind of a reasonable schedule. You know, if it takes a couple of days, that's fine. And number two, we will definitely have a weather delay. I mean, there's no point in going out there in the middle of a storm um, for a variety of reasons. So um, we, we will do that. But I think with a little bit of flexibility and cooperation, we ought to be able to uh, work out something that is quite useful. Okay, anything else on the site visit? Any other hands? All right. Okay, so is there, just before, I think we're about ready to wrap up. Is there anything else anybody would like to cover today on, on any issues regarding this hearing that I've missed? All right, hearing none, we'll, We'll move forward. Um, first of all, thank you all very much. Um, I really appreciate your uh, professional presentations, uh, both your written filings and your, your presentations and demeanors today. I mean, it just, it makes life a lot easier for me when everyone behaves professionally. And obviously all of you are qualified and experienced. And, and I just wanna say thank you very much for that. Um, my plan is to prepare a pre-hearing conference order which we will post on our website, send to everyone on the AHO virus general e email list and send my email to each of you on the updated service list. Um, we definitely will postpone the August 31 deadline for filing exhibits and the September 21, 23 hearing dates. So those are off. Um, my current plan is to set new exhibit filing dates and new hearing dates so that they will be on everyone's calendar uh, with plenty of advance notice uh, in case I do decide 
after considering all of the papers uh, to, to uh, that the hearing should proceed. Uh, obviously, if we decide to dismiss uh, the draft CDO, the hearing may not proceed, but I, I want to get them on everyone's calendar with plenty of advance notice. I think that is, it makes it easier for you to proceed. So don't, don't, in, don't try to read anything into that other than I'm trying to keep this thing on schedule based on the admonitions I said earlier from my five uh, supervisors for keeping things moving forward. Uh, so that's what we will do. And then, as I mentioned before, if anyone wants to conduct discovery, um, please consider scheduling that within the scope of the, the new schedule. Um, finally, if anyone has any updates to the service list, please send them to the AHO. The easiest way is to send them to our email address with copies to the other parties as soon as you have the update so we can keep an up, updated service list. So. With that, Mr. Don, it looks like your hand's up for one last question. Go ahead. One last question, Mr. Lilly. Thank you. Um, in our uh, notice of intent, uh, we were not able to identify the proper witnesses. Um, in our pre-hearing conference statement, we reserve the right, um, uh, depending on the outcome of today, um, uh, to update uh, our, pre our notice of intent to include witnesses. Um, is that, um, can, can your pre-hearing conference order please uh, address uh, our right to add uh, our expert witnesses um, and non-expert witnesses to our NOI? Yes, that is a very good point. Um, and what I'll do, since it's going to be more time before we come to the hearing, and you know, frankly, I'll just say the main reason I wanted to get those NOIs in now was so I could get a new service list. So I, we didn't have to keep sending things out to 50 or 60 parties a lot by mail. Um, so I, the order will have a new date for NOIs um, with witness lists and, and anybody may, and for any reason, you, at this point, you don't even need any excuses, uh, but um, we will have, everyone will have the opportunity to file a new designation of witnesses uh, if, if they want to. They can, you can rely on your old NOI, but if you want to file an updated one, uh, you may do so. So thank you, Mr. Donlin. That's, that's a very important point. All right, anything else for today? We're just about done. Any last hands or anything? I don't, don't see anybody else with a, a hand up. All right, I will do everything I can to uh, get this order the pre-hearing conference order out as soon as I can. I will try to get it out by Friday. Uh, potentially, it could be into next week, but uh, you do have the dates, the first of which is going to be September 10, and, and we will go from there. All right, Mr. Lowe, are you just adjusting your iPad or are you trying to raise your hand? No, just adjusting your iPad, okay. All right, one last call for anything else. All right, otherwise, thank you all very much and, and have a good day. 